So let's go ahead and take a look at the portfolio. Rappahannock, it's an excellent portfolio, about a dozen stocks. Um, what you see here is our dashboard where we have um, basically accumulated what we think are the most important characteristics. You know, we already covered the, some of the more important ones over here on the side. Uh, again, the growth rate, the projected PE of the stocks, the projected yield, financial strength, earnings per share stability, all of those are very important characteristics. And even more important than that is what do they all add up to? What do they all add up to? And we see that down here in the, the weighted averages down at the bottom. So again, we're looking at companies from Research in Motion as the, the, the company that has the, the highest projected returns. Again, for those of you out there that may be new to Manifest Investing, that 23.7 is color-coded in yellow simply because it is so much higher than the general average for the stock market. If the average stock has a, has a, a projected annual return of about 12, that's just simply, um, when we use 10, plus 10% 10 as the cutoff point, it's getting up there and probably too good to be true land and uh, could be a situation where other shoes have yet to drop and just, just something to be very careful with. Um, Adobe Systems is, is right up at the top also with a fairly high projected annual return and a, and a high quality rating. But I'd kind of like to take a step aside and, and just talk about the concept of focusing on these down here at the bottom uh, more appropriately. So let's go ahead and take a time out from the portfolio and talk about this. I think some of you in the audience are probably familiar with this gentleman. His name is Marcus Buckingham. He wrote this book, uh, First Break All the Rules. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to hear Marcus give a presentation, I've seen him a couple of times, uh, out, just simply outstanding. And uh, one of the reasons that I, I bring up Marcus is in the book he tells a story about uh, it basically has to do with performance reviews and, and you know, management appraisals with dealing with employees. You know, Marcus worked for the, the Gallup organization, as you can see here. And uh, they basically did a study of you know, key success factors and that kind of stuff. But one of the things that they found, and this, this extends to many areas of life, is we tend to focus in on, you know, going back to this last slide, especially if you had the, the valuation statement and, and perhaps research in motion is down. Um, one of the first things investment club partners will do is they'll run and they'll, they'll focus in on the ones that have the red ink. And in fact, sometimes it, it, it used to drive me so crazy back with our family investment club back several years ago that I would take the valuation statement off that show in, in the column where it showed how much we had gained or lost, and I'd actually take a pair of scissors to it and cut it off. So because you don't really want to be focusing in on that, you know. We as a culture, it's just kind of an instinctive thing. We'll dive in and say, well, what, what stock has been losing money for us? And uh, you, you really want to try to fight that. And w what I mean here is Buckingham tells the story about, you know, how, you know, how do we as parents treat our children's report cards? And I told this, this story in our most recent uh, newsletter in, the, in our cover story. You know, when our son would bring home a report card, you know, there'd be like, you know, a couple of A's, a couple of B's, maybe a C on it, and and we we had to train ourselves to not talk about the C first. You know, I think many parents have, have fought this struggle. And what Buckingham says is, stop stop focusing in on the C, and instead frame it in terms of, well, here here you you know, son, you've got these two A's. You know what, you know what caused that to happen? How can we make more of that happen? And by virtue of talking about the strengths there. Um, really focus more attention on, well, how do we recreate that? Or how do we make that happen again? And that's what I'd kind of like to focus us in on tonight is uh, the, the Rappahannock Investment Club has, uh, has a wonderful success story here in, in Tractor Supply. Flipping it back over here, I mean, uh, you, you see this. It's got one of the lower projected returns in the whole portfolio, so it's, it's something you need to think about. Again, you know, you can almost think of the whole overall dashboard or portfolio as a report card. If we're trying to raise this 8.8, .8, one of the ways to do that is to replace some of the 4.6s on here, or some of these at the bottom, with some of these higher numbers at the top. That's part of our, our regimen. But again, we want to focus in on, you know, that 4.6. Why is it so low? And the reason it's so low is the ladies actually began buying the stock right back here. You know, so they, they discovered it. They were buying tractor supply back in the fairly early days of the investment club. At that time, if you had turned to the value line company report, and again, they mentioned that one of their uh, their mentors, their champions, 
talked about value line as a resource. The value line, low total return forecast back in that time frame was almost too good to be true, up in the high 20s. But uh, again, this is a situation where they, they, they got into it, probably bought it at a price between $15 and $20 a share. It has now suddenly gone wham. It's all the way up to uh, approaching 70 now, so it's, it's gone up um, several hundred percent in the span of a couple of years, and if, if the ladies are not high-fiving over this one, they should be. But at the same time that you're high-fiving, you also want to place it in long-term context. Now, especially for a relatively new club, again, three and a half years, you don't want to be too obsessed with the notion of selling, but it is, it is time to start thinking about it. If you haven't had any selling discussions yet, here's a nice one to have. Because if you, if you go back just a few years and looking at this stock as an example, back in this time frame, with, with the stock price somewhere in the 25 to 30 range, you can see that the projected returns, the return forecasts at that time, were basically where they're at now. Okay, not the end of the world, but basically the situation uh, is that this stock went from 25 to 30 down into the, the 15 to 20 range over the next couple of years. These are quarterly snapshots. And, uh, you know, basically the money was, or the, the stock price was flat or down for an extended period, you know, following a time period when the projected in return or the return forecast was relatively low. So, again, place that in context as you're thinking about what's going on right now. This is a stock that's uh, run pretty hard, pretty fast. I would not be the least, I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. This thing could be $100 in, in next week. I doubt it, but it, it could be. Um, but in terms of the probability, the probability is the tractor supply will probably either hit a plateau or a, a fairly significant decline at some point over the next several months. And just something you want to be thinking about. Again, it's just a probability. But it's, it's probably got a higher probability than some of the other stocks in the portfolio. So again, celebrate, but uh, take a deep breath and think about what can actually happen to the stock. It does have the, the lowest expected returns right now, and just make sure that you keep it in context. Just to make sure that we're talking about uh, uh, defining terms, this is the 6%. This is from the current value line sheet for tractor supply. Lori, is there a question or a comment? There is one question, um, but maybe you want to wait a little bit. Uh, Nancy Lud Ludicky was asking, uh -huh. uh, when you had the discretionary uh, Part of the of the chart. What which stocks were included in that? Okay. Um, well, we can come back and answer it more completely. But um, basically, anything that has to do with shopping. So let's go ahead and go back to um, the consumer discretionary stocks. Are basically all the stocks at the bottom that have done so well: Walmart, McDonald's, Dollar Tree stores, Tractor Supply. Um, did I say McDonald's? Um, Procter & Gamble is going to be classified as a staple, so is CVS Caremark. Comcast is going to be a discretionary stock. You can choose whether or not to have cable. Um, that's pretty much all of them. So again, uh, and again, if you look at those bottom three all by themselves, that's you know, 24, 37, 56 percent of the portfolio is in those bottom three stocks. And those are all consumer discretionary. I know somebody had asked in the forum if Kurt could uh, put a little pop-up window on those charts that showed which stocks were in each section, and uh, he's being really responsive lately, so maybe we'll see that. That would be really helpful, too. That That is something that we'll probably look into. I, I will show you what he did do on every stock page now. You can see sector and industry for every stock, so you can just click through to it. So if we get a chance to do a little demonstration, I can show that. Okay. All right. So you get by my, all my Madden squiggles here. Again, just to make sure we're talking, uh, defining what we're talking about, we follow, at Manifest Investing, we follow Value Line as one of the influences on our forecasts. And one of the numbers that we really like to gut check or, or second opinion against, however you want to think about it, is this uh, 6%. That is the same 6% that you see um, here, for this, this number right here. So what you're seeing right here, here on the, the preceding slide is that 6%. So that's the number that we look at for any company. And again, the, the average one right now, if you go through the entire value line standard edition, the average right now would be approximately 10 or 11%.
So again, that 6% is below the average. Um, just a couple other things, just to nudge some thinking for the club or if anybody else is out there following this company. The current PE is 23. That doesn't seem like a lot, but when you come down here and you look at you know, the typical range, it hasn't been 23 very often. And looking out here to the longer term forecast of 20, it's, it's above that. So again, you're not going to see PE expansion here. Um, if anything, you're going to see some compression. And uh, when we take a look at it uh, at Manifest, we take a look at S&P, Morningstar, and a few other sources. Uh, we think it would be um, completely normal for this thing to, to track in the 17 to 18 range instead of the 20. So that's also part of what we look at. The other thing is, is in order to even get to that 6% number, Take a look at what Value Line has assumed as a long-term profitability as measured by the net profit margin, 5.7%. And then come back here and look, well, how many times have they done that in history? Not saying that it can't be done. Uh, this company is extremely well managed. They could continue in, in raising that net profit margin. Keep in mind that they're up against Lowe's and Home Depot, and uh, you're talking about some behemoths that basically operate in the 4 to 5% range when it comes to this statistic. So in order to do that, they're, they're definitely um, taking on the challenge. So bring all that to bear as you, as you think about it. And then just this one, a quick one, just look, looking back at, at 15, approximately 15 years of McDonald's, the same type of chart, it's the same type of numbers we were just talking about for tractor supply. And the reason that I bring this up, again, is, is just to urge people not to ignore low total return forecasts. You know, when you have a relatively low forecast, it can hang up there for quite a while. But in this case, uh, McDonald's uh, really got its head handed to it. This is a drop of, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent down to this low. So again, sometimes the uh, it, it doesn't pay to, to ignore low total return forecasts for too long. And again, just the opposite side is true here, very much like we saw for tractor supply getting in when this thing was at uh, probably the buys of its of its entire operating history. Uh, and the, the company went from 10 to, I believe it is now, in the 90 range as it's continued on this trend. So again, um, don't ignore the, the total return forecasts. Comment, Lori? Just uh, Don Lennon was asking what the gray shaded areas on those value line reports are in the charts. Oh, good question. Those are recessions. Those are what uh, the whatever the people who sit in that dark room and figure out, you know, when a recession starts and stops. This is the Great Recession back in uh, 2008, 2009, and then the the previous recession before that was back in the year 2001. And uh, incredibly enough, I think you have to go all the way back to at least 1994 to get another recession. Um, so that's just something that. that to keep in mind as you do your studies, uh, recessions are incredibly disruptive to our analysis. And I'm, I'm really sugarcoating that. Um, you, you really want to be watching trends and, and that type of stuff, but they're incredibly disruptive. That's one of the reasons that everybody's got the heebie-jeebies over a, you know, the potential for a double dip recession you know, somewhere in here. Let's hope not, because it, be, it would be painful again. Okay. So again, as we saw in the pie chart, the, the Rappahannock Club really sh should embrace, and I, I think they should embrace smaller companies also. This is one of the charts we use to make the point. Um, uh, the blue line here is the S&P 500. S&P 500, that's all large companies. So I'm just right 500 here. And again, this is what some people refer, are referring to when they refer to the lost decade because you start over here on the left, you basically end up at a relatively small gain over a 10-year period somewhere for that as the lost decade. The red, the red line here is the Russell 2000. This is a collection of small companies known as the, it's an index, small cap index, the Russell 2000. You can see that that fairly significantly outperformed the large. But even more compelling, and the, this is one of the major takeaways here with size diversification. Um, this ticker symbol, VAY, stands for the value line arithmetic average. And again, just the, the thing to remember is that the value line arithmetic average does have you know, all those large companies. It has uh, quite a few medium-sized companies, too. And it does have some small in it. So it's an all-of-the-above collection of companies. And this is what we're aiming for. 
I mean, everybody here in the room is a whole lot happier with this result than this result. So again, avoid being overly concentrated in the large blue cap stocks. Don't ignore them. By ab absolutely do not ignore them because they've been stuck in the mud for so long they're going to take off and go up someday. So you want to have those large, but you also want to have an appropriate mix of small, medium, and large for the reasons shown here. And uh, this is a fairly dramatic difference between the two. And again, uh, as we continue to argue about whether we're coming out of a recession or back into one or whatever, um, these are the type of companies that typically do uh, pretty well coming out of recession. So uh, you definitely want to have them in the portfolio. You want to find promising small companies to uh, to enjoy. One last place to make the point, same three numbers, only this time I used the, the Wilshire 5000. It was true for last year. It's not going to be true every year, but it was true for last year. But what's really important is over the longer term, this collection of all of the above, small, medium, and large companies outperforms the other two. And again, the other two are so cap-weighted, uh, very dominated by the large companies. These two are almost the same, even though the Wilshire 5000 is uh, obviously 5,000 companies. So again, use these slides to help convince club partners, not only in the Rappahannock Club, but uh, all investment clubs and personal portfolios out there that small a combination of small, medium, and large makes a lot of sense. Mark, uh, yeah, Roy uh, Chastain is asking a question that I kind of have too, which says uh, McDonald's has a low par, but as a high quality defensive stock, isn't it okay to keep it for stability? Absolutely. You know, and the answer is it depends on the, the portfolio, which we're going to have up here and again in a, a few seconds. Um, going back here to look at it, McDonald's, first of all, there's nothing wrong with a 7% par. Um, nothing. Nothing wrong with a 7% par. That's that's deep into a hold range. Now, what we could typically counsel is that for a company like McDonald's with such a high quality rating, you can just see the strength here. Um, the lines are obviously straight on the stock selection guide. Here's 100, by the way, Walmart. Um, the financial strength is also high, pays a nice dividend. Um, this is definitely a core holding. And what we, what we basically suggest with core holdings is you wouldn't really think about selling it unless you desperately needed it to, uh, to impact the overall portfolio, and that's simply not the case, or it's rarely the case, um, until the projected annual return for a company like McDonald's approaches money market rates which right now, let's, let's be generous and call them 1%. So again, McDonald's is, uh, is one of those you know, bunkering down positions in the portfolio. Tractor Supply is also to a, a slightly lesser degree, but it's also a company that you're not going to rush out and sell, even though this is down in the uh, 4 to 5% range right now. Does that help, Lori? Or... Again, think of it in terms of selling, and this, this is something we've shared with audiences on many occasions here lately, you know, you know, I think everybody here under, understands or instinctively understands that we, we should have different buying criteria depending on the company. If you're buying a core company like McDonald's or Johnson & Johnson or, you know, one of those type of companies, first of all, the, the projected returns never get uh, stratospheric, at least they, in the McDonald's case one time in their history. But most of the time, they're in uh, you know mid-teens, a uh, little bit more subdued. You got to be willing to take some of those on under those conditions. At the same token, you hang on to them until they drop lower. Like I said, approaching money market returns for a company like Ford, for example, it's a little different story. You treat it a little bit differently. It's non-core. You can see these numbers are definitely a whole lot different than the other ones. So you would probably have different selling criteria for Ford. My selling criteria for Ford would be to consider selling it, aside from the fact that we are a Chrysler household and we wouldn't be allowed to have Ford in this house, but uh, no, just kidding. Uh, I would be in inclined to sell Ford if its projected annual return ever approached or dropped below that median market return, which right now is about 12%. So again, Ford has uh, been a wonderful stock for, for the ladies also, um, but I think I would use my value line uh, low total return forecast to watch for a selling condition on that one also. Just treat them differently. Core, think about selling and buying differently depending on whether you're talking about a core holding or a non-core holding. 
All right. Just thought I would come back and Mark, reinforce. We met. Go ahead, Lori. Yeah. Um, here's a good question about what you were just talking about. No, Noel good, uh, Rodman is asking, when should the 15% financial strength become more paramount than the good par of 13.5? When should the... I guess she means bad 15% financial strength. Okay, for well, Ford. Well, for Ford, Ford, yeah, well, Ford is definitely, uh, it's a creature of its own, right? It's a, it's non-core. Um, the answer to the question really comes down to what does it all add up to? Uh, there's nothing wrong with 88. So it's basically, again, keep in mind that this is only 3.7% of the portfolio. Um, it, it, it really doesn't enter in unless the overall portfolio is, is suffering too much. Again, you're going to be treating this, as, in my opinion, as a non-core holding anyhow, triggering off of, of selling if this 13.5 gets down around 10. 10 or 11 under, under, under current market conditions. So we can take a look at that in a few minutes. But again, uh, what you really want to be focused in on, first of all, you know, for the core part of your portfolio, you want to you want to make sure that the weighted average is sufficiently high, and that's true here. Uh, this group of ladies is uh, is uh, speculating a little bit with Ford. It'd be interesting to hear if there's more behind that story. Um, and Betty Taylor is asking why you're calling Ford a non-core company. Well, non-core because it's it's so erratic. It's uh, for one thing. It's got a very low quality rating. It's got a fairly low financial strength rating. It's got an extremely low um, quality rating. And in fact, the earnings are so erratic that we use cash flow when forming the the return forecast for it. So it, it, I think it's a slam dunk non-core company. If we if we put it to a poll this community would probably give it at least a 95% and only 5% would be voting with their heart because they either work at Ford or they know somebody who does. Anybody else?